uh, my name is Richard Shaw. Thanks for the introduction, a kind introduction. Um, it's always nice to be invited by another specialty. Um, and uh, there may be a few maxillofacial surgeons creeping into the Zoom call, but it's, it's very nice to be asked by um, sister specialties. So I'm presenting on uh, behalf of Liverpool Head and Neck Centre, which is a quite a multidisciplinary group. And I'm presenting today on um, the latest data for COVID surge head and neck. So this is a big collaborative. Some of you know a bit about it and I apologize for having used some of the slides. So this all started, the story started, I guess, uh, just about 13 months ago. And we were sort of just descending into the first wave of COVID and we were seeing big impacts in our hospitals. And I think we didn't know what to do for the best. And we didn't know what to worry about most. And we were seeing pictures around the world and Nightingale hospitals being built. And I guess some people were principally worried about, um, I guess, their own health. Some people were worried about the hospital and wanting to contribute to the hospital. Some people were worried about operating on people, thinking if we brought people into hospital to operate on them, we would kill them with COVID. Um, some people were worried about their cancer operating list. They're worried for the, the sake of their cancer patients and you know what would happen if they canceled their lists like the hospital managers were told them to do. And the problem was we didn't know what to do for the best. This was a very novel experience for us and we didn't have any data to base any decisions on. So the background in head and neck cancer I think was particularly concerning. Um, we had lots of concerns, lots of anecdotes, but no data. We had this series of rapidly growing tumors. Um, some of the therapies are reliant on primary surgery um, no acceptable delay therapy. We couldn't hold them with hormones. We couldn't hold them with chemotherapy. Um, high risk uh, because of aerosol generating procedures working in the airway. We'd had those reports of, I think, deaths of ENT surgeons and high rates of infection in China with head and neck healthcare workers. And then we had some opinion based guidance on about avoiding tracheostomies, avoiding free flaps, uh, avoiding anything major in the elderly. And um, we didn't know what to do. So in terms of the idea of collecting data, well, that was impossible because you need a clinical trial or a cohort. You need to get support for it and funding and contracts and all the regulator approvals. It takes forever. And to actually generate the data and turn it around would take far too long. And so we had these guidelines that were produced by um, quite a broad church of head and neck experts. And um, again, the recommendation was to avoid tracheostomies, avoid free flaps, uh, offer palliation only for those over 85. Um, and this was controversial. Um, There's some comments from, uh, to this paper um, about needing uh, data rather than expert opinion. So in one of my uh, roles as, um, I was actually trying to help uh, the Global Surgery Unit. I was trying to help them launch their COVID surge project and get research nurse support in NHR, which I failed to do because um, Chris Whitty probably quite rightly got hold of research support and focused it entirely on interventional studies regarding COVID. Um, but in the meantime, um, my colleagues in Birmingham who did a lot of uh, international global research on uh, various aspects of surgery had actually just pivoted their entire research machine and showed a lot of vision uh, and credit to them for doing that and just relaunched all their efforts towards collecting data on the interaction of COVID and surgery, hence COVID surge. And their basically focus were to collect a cohort of patients who were gonna be treated in the first three months of the COVID pandemic. And after the conversation with Anil here in Birmingham, um, I realized there was enormous merit in launching a head and neck group. And so on the 24th of March, I agreed in principle to try and get a few people together. Later that afternoon, I got some funding from Basso um, and two days later, we'd assembled a head and neck team with some colleagues in uh, Europe, Spain, Australia, USA, and some UK clinicians. Um, and with the support of colleagues in Birmingham, we launched COVID surge head and neck. So we added a, a few uh, data points that were head and neck specific to their existing uh, data, which is gonna be collected on REDCap. And we got permissions and we were able to be the first unit to open in Liverpool on the 3rd of April. So that's a week after um, conceiving the idea and we're actually entering data onto a red cap database. And you think, oh, well, this won't pick up. People won't be keen. And 
through, I guess, the head and neck uh, contacts we've made and the organizations and through COVID surge as well. And I think also the motivation to collect data, to answer the question, it was different. It wasn't just old Joe Soap's pet project. It was, uh, it captured the imagination of people. I think that's fair to say. So we were able to get the first data in and try and uh, pick holes in our uh, data forms. And so the idea was to understand the range of surgery and the safety of surgery and head and neck cancer in the first three months of the pandemic, but also to contribute our head and neck data to the bigger COVID surge projects. So as I said, this is a red cap project. Um, it was the first three months, which was basically taken as March through to June. Um, we needed surgery of curative intent in the head and neck and the publicity, as you'd expect, going as big as we could with social media. So the outcome measures were um, severe pulmonary complications of COVID-19 within 30 days. Um, and so it's a composite diagnostic criteria of either severe complications and a positive lab test or convincing radiological clinical criteria. So it, it's a bit loose, but um, if the more prescriptive you are, the more difficulty is getting everybody around the world to agree. And Sorry to interrupt you, Prof Shaw. Yeah. Um, my view is still only on of slide seven, and I'm uh -huh. not sure if the other attendees are also having. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah. I'm on slide 16 now. So is that where well, we're meant I, to be? If I end the show and restart it on slide 16, shall I see what happens? Uh, I have no idea why that happened. How's that? Yeah, I've got slide 16 and slide 16 in front of me now. So hopefully that's what yeah. everyone else is also seeing. That's great. Thank you. Sorry well, for I'll, that. I'll, I'll just ask you if it moves along all right. I have no idea how that happened. Um, so the, the secondary outcome. We are, we are on presenter view, but if that's okay with you, that's fine. Yeah, that's great. Uh, fine. Yeah. Okay. So the secondary uh, endpoints were probably what you'd expect. And in fact, we added one that they hadn't done in COVID. So in fact, they'd argued about it and not added it which is whether any members of the surgical team uh, became positive. So um, we collected data. So this is an initial trawl of um, the patients who were collected by the middle of April and, re and we had all the data in by June. And in fact, there's, there's later data coming. So this was enough. It was 1,100 patients over 133 hospitals uh, over 26 countries. And basically we were able to analyze this fairly early. Um, so the commonest conditions were oral cavity, thyroid, and skin. And I'll show you the data later, but essentially the larynx and oropharynx were underrepresented basically because uh, these patients went for radiotherapy. So I was gonna check, Rajita, are you seeing the right slides now? I'll, I'll take it as a yes. Um, and the characteristics of the- That was a yes, tumor, yeah. Yeah, great, thanks, thanks. Uh, the characteristics of the tumour was that quite a few patients were less fit with ASA over three, quite a few elderly patients, um, and a split between major and minor surgery with comorbidities as you'd expect. And at this point, uh, so this is you know March and April, only half the patients were screened for COVID on admission. It seems like a long time ago, wasn't it? When we were admitting patients without a COVID test. And so 89% um, included removal of a primary tumour, 50% included a neck dissection, um, a third had reconstruction and only half of those were free flap, which is interesting because we'd probably expect more free flaps uh, on a previous series. And um, a lot of patients were extubated, 17% had a tracheostomy. So coming on to the key data here, and I'm going fairly quickly, so a uh, 3% uh, of the patients in this cohort developed COVID within 13 day, 30 days. So not apocalyptic, but not to be ignored. And of those 3%, one in three developed severe pneumonia and one in 10, so an overall 0.3% died due to COVID-19. So uh, a catastrophe for the people that got ill and died, but overall fairly reassuring overall rates. Um, and I suppose 0.3% death rate fits in with the risk of other serious um, post-operative deaths, you know, medical and surgical uh, perioperative deaths within 30 days in the same sort of ballpark. So this was reassuring. We could sort of worry about cancer more than COVID, even in this era before testing. The rest of the complications were somewhat unremarkable. Flat failure in 1%, 30-day mortality overall, 1.2%. It would, it would be unremarkable for a series of head and neck surgery. 
And so we did some limited um, analysis, univariate analysis. So this is by patient safety. So looking at the primary endpoint of COVID pneumonia, the associations were with advanced tumors by T stage and end stage and critical care admission. But interesting, no associations with free flaps, tracheostomies, um, comorbidity or elderly patients. Clinician safety was interesting. Um, members of the team developed COVID after about four to the operations, but there was this really strong association. So in a quarter of cases where the patient was positive, a clinician treating them also became positive. A really strong association, much higher than we thought. And there's certainly this evidence of, um, well, we don't know which direction, but cross-infection between clinicians and patients. And, and our estimates based on this number of um, 3% is that the clinical infection rate of surgeons, head and neck surgeons, is 10 times the respective community infection rate. And, and this association with a patient who's positive really just swamped any other um, uh, univariate analysis. So obviously we saw more healthcare worker positives in high community incidents with all cavity cases and tracheostomies, but it's this association with positive patients, which was the important thing. We were also interested in how the surgery had changed or been de-escalated. Um, like we've got, you know, smoking gun evidence that um, larynx and oropharynx had been migrated towards non-surgical treatment and oral cavity is to probably to a certain extent de-escalated treatment, less neck dissection, less free flaps. It's difficult to prove that. You're working against historical norms and, you know, it's difficult to be certain but broadly speaking, you can estimate in the countries we were looking at um, the percentage of head and neck tumours that are oral cavity, oropharynx, larynx, the percentage of those that receive uh, primary surgery. And we can probably see there are missing operations for larynx and oropharynx. And, and the data here is a little bit weak in a retrospective study without a control group. Uh, sorry, not retrospective, but a, you know, a simple cohort without an intervention. Observational study is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, so, um, so with a higher rate of tumours amenable to surgery, we're treated with radiotherapy. Um, neck management was considerably more conservative and complex reconstructions were used less in only about a quarter of oral cavity cases. Um, we haven't got data here about de-escalation of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but parallel data was collected by CTRAD in the UK. I haven't seen that data. So the conclusions of this paper were that head and neck surgery was safer than we'd feared, and predominantly safe even when surgery was complex. COVID-19 was uncommon, but in cases uh, we did see it, it was severe with severe complications and outcome uh, in terms of mortality and severe pneumonia. And then this um, worrying overlap between patients and surgeons, which must reflect a failing in PPE and also probably in testing. And then we've got this significant therapeutic migration and de-escalation of surgery and possibly delay of surgery and understanding what difference that might have made to the cancers and the uh, overall cure rates. So that got uh, published very quickly in Cancer. And um, one of my colleagues, Hans, who was a colorectal surgeon from the Southwest, produced this lovely graphic abstract that we went big on social media with. Uh, and he very nicely summarized all of the key data onto this nice abstract, which uh, became the focus for the social media. So you'll be aware of this, but we have this very flat authorship profile. So on this initial paper, we had uh, nearly 850 co-authors and all of these are PubMed citable. They all have equal status on the paper. Although there were writing groups, stats group, operations group, um, it's, it's a very flat model. And that hopefully uh, gets us buy-in for further papers and makes it genuinely collaborative. Um, in terms of altimetrics, um, this um, scored quite highly. Cancer is a reasonably good journal, um, but of, uh, of outputs of similar age from this journal, this was in the top sort of one or two percent outputs overall for all research was in the top 100,000 of 18 million outputs. So, you know, we're able to, even on social media and, um, and altimetrics sort of record impact. Interestingly, I'm just playing forwards now to all of the COVID surge patient accrual um, for 2020 was 190,000 patients across 2000 hospitals in 120 countries. 
So they've created an absolute monster because all these things were happening in parallel um, with other areas of surgery, colorectal surgery, breast surgery, with other areas of surgery not cancer related, and um, indeed in COVID surge week and parallel projects. So the future work, which is now becoming present work. Um, so although I presented data for 1,133 patients, we actually collected data from five and a half thousand cancer patients for the first three months of the pandemic. There basically just wasn't time to clean, process and deal with it. Um, so we actually drew a line under this study in terms of patient uh, data entry in September. So that was for patients entered up to the 1st of June. And um, that's a work in progress to reanalyze the whole larger cohort. We didn't really have enough funding to do that. Um, so we approached Barno and they didn't have enough funding, but they supported us in running a specific uh, grand challenge where we set the mission of raising 30,000 pounds to do the follow-up studies. And so the idea was we were gonna virtually run, swim, cycle, anything that was legal from Land's End to John O'Groats. And um, uh, thanks to Jason and Andrew for putting this project together with Barno. They're both common to the project and the, uh, and the Barno initiative. And the idea was that we were going to run the follow-up study with BICOPS, who are an observational study team in Birmingham um, and Liverpool uh, Clinical Trial Centre. So this graphic in the middle is us all on the 1st of August last year doing our various jogs, runs and cycles. There's Stuart from Oxford doing his bike ride, um, Andrew Shaki, uh, Paul Nankival doing uh, quite nice runs. I, I do a bit of cycling, so there's me time trialling. I did a 100 mile time trial because all my races got cancelled last year. And in fact, we raised the 30,000 pounds. So the idea was, was to pay for staff in bike ops and statisticians to do the rest of the study. Um, the other thing we wanted to do um, was this work on uh, head and neck capacity during the second wave uh, during the Northern Hemisphere. So with regard to the follow-up study, today um, registration opened, and this was publicised by social media. Um, it's the way we do things these days. And uh, Andrew's now leading this aspect of the work and registration opened today. And the idea is, is that we have these 5,000 patients um, registered um, for this period from March to June and we're going to collect one year follow-up in June this year and two year follow-up in June next year because we want to understand the, uh, the outcome of these patients. Um, we want to understand uh, prognosis and function um, and disease control and that's for two reasons I guess one of which we want to fully understand the impact of COVID on cancer but actually, intriguingly, we also want to um, understand what effect it has when you de-escalate treatment and you don't give chemo when you should, or you reduce radiotherapy dose, or you emit a neck dissection that normally would have had a neck dissection. And to see exactly what difference it might make, this is a one-off opportunity to collect data from patients who maybe have had, as it were, the wrong treatment. So um, having created a cohort, we thought there was value in collecting it. So the other issue that was getting on last autumn, um, Chris Whitty was a naysayer and said, we're gonna see real problems in COVID-19 this winter. And we were all sat there in August thinking, nah, we've cured COVID, it's over. And of course, by January, we had a huge problem and um, in many ways, a worse problem. So the second surge was widely predicted. And what plans were put in place for cancer surgery? Uh, were we up to shape, you know, was PPE, COVID-free pathways, vaccines, other safety measures in place? What was the strategy and the UK versus the international picture? So we became concerned that we hadn't learned the lessons. And in January, we decided to go with the collaborators we developed just with a, a idea for a separate survey by REDCap. So we did this uniquely for COVID surge head and neck. It wasn't done for the rest of COVID surge. And we collected data for the first week of February this year. Um, we did a data lock at uh, February the 8th and in essence, we published the first trawl of that data in a paper um, at 10 o'clock that same night. I've always wondered whether it's possible to write a paper in a day, and I think we've proved that it was. Um, and that was preprint peer-reviewed on Authoria um, five days later. 
and accepted the publication and more formally in Clinoto um, a month after that. And so um, this, this study is what I'm going to talk about now, which is the update. So we wanted to evaluate the differences in surgical capacity for head and neck cancer between the first wave and the second wave. And we did a survey, um, a very simple survey using REDCap. Um, we actually collated UK data and international data. So initially, I'm just going to present the UK data. So the data completeness was fantastic. Um, Darno did a report a few years ago and reckoned there were 64 hospitals doing head and neck surgery, and we got data for 62 of them. So we got pretty much the whole UK picture. So um, we found that 50% overall of head and neck cancer patients in the first week of February were having compromised treatment. 28% delayed, 12% de-escalated, and 10% treatment migration to radiotherapy. In the worst third of hospitals, 82% of head and neck cancer patients uh, needing surgery had compromised treatment. And the restriction of capacity was, if anything, a little bit worse than the first wave. And despite the six months lead time to prepare, the NHS couldn't cope. And um, interestingly, NHS cancer referrals for head and neck were about 65% of normal last spring. And by February this year, they'd picked up to 80%. So at no point have we reported 100% um, overall for the country. We've still got tumours upstaging out there that we should be seeing. So this is the sort of data we're able to get. Um, just looking at uh, theatre capacity for February 21. And, and again, for the worst affected, for those with less than 50% capacity, um, we're seeing you know, surgery delayed on half, de-escalated on 15%. And very small numbers of alternative sites used. Um, so we're able to sort of break things out regionally. And you know, really just unpicking this data, what we saw was that um, in every region, there were hospitals that essentially had no, no capacity at all. There were, there were hospitals, often the big COVID hubs, that were totally um, restricted in cancer surgery uh, in February this year. But every region also had hospitals with near 100% capacity. And in fact, some hospitals had more than 100%. Well, how can that be true? Well, there were the odd site that uh, only treat cancer and don't treat COVID. So there's a few sites around the place, like the Marsden, East Grinstead, there'll be others you know about. And also there were places that really did effectively cull their elective activity. They made space for emergency and cancer, and they weren't as badly affected by COVID as they expected. So there were some troubling things that happened. Um, in Christmas week, um, a load of ambulances went with ventilated patients from London to Birmingham. Um, because Birmingham has very good ITU capacity at the QE because of their military wing. And then Birmingham had its own wave of COVID in the first week of January, second week, and their fate was sealed. They had uh, 1,000 COVID patients and 200 ventilated. And there wasn't really a pattern of mutual aid to distribute the Birmingham head and neck patients who were ready to operate on around the country. And that seemed to be a big omission on behalf of the NHS. So this regional picture um, was interesting and you know this minority units have had huge capacity possibly really wasn't very well used um, and we picked six units with less than five percent of their normal activity um, essentially had no no access to any surgery um, and you know they all had hospitals within 50 to 100 mile radius that could have taken their patients so this mismatch between capacity and demand didn't really result in a proper movement of cases um, so the other trends were surgeons were less likely to accept de-escalation, so they were more likely to make patients wait um, but have the right treatment, and were less likely to accept therapeutic migration. Again, they were more likely to say, hold on for surgery, don't go off for having radiotherapy if the decision was for surgery. So is head and neck, has head and neck been worse affected than other, other surgical oncology disciplines? Well, I suppose head and neck surgery has this onerous requirement for airway skills, uh, specialist nursing, uh, professions allied to medicine. We've got bulky, expensive, fragile specialist kit like microscopes, plating kits, lasers, robots. And I think it does make us near uniquely um, stuck in COVID hubs, in the large acute trusts, and um, in that regard, possibly unable to move. Um, and I think many of our patients are also unable to move um, 
to the local private hospital and have the operation that maybe you know maybe skin cancer breast cancer some other things can move and i think the idea of moving your service away from um your main hub for head and neck cancer surgery for major surgery at least is just not on the cards so the uk lead time to prepare for the second wave we were told by chris witty in august it was at least six months so with nhs central strategic control it was presumably plausible and certainly highly desirable to optimize available resource and this has unveiled considerable systems and political fragility as well as capacity fragility in the nhs we've got life critical but elective services are very vulnerable to acute emergency pressures and this mismatch between supply and demand appears to be severe in a significant minority of hospitals but wasn't properly addressed so which organization had both the capacity and authority and data to implement decisive actions and move patients around the country? And the answer was none. Um, there was a head in the sand approach. The other thing we've seen is that we have not recovered normal head and neck cancer referral weights at this point in February 21. So we are going to face this bow wave of delayed upstaged head and neck cancer cases ahead of us for the months ahead of us, I think. And that's certainly what we're seeing in Liverpool. We, for the first time, we've got really unacceptable treatment delays pushing out to six, seven weeks. Um, and we were able to compete, keep enough capacity to deal with the cases that came our way all through last year. We were just aware there were less cases than there should have been. So again, Hans uh, later did this lovely graphic abstract, which I hope is going to play if I press the right button, there we are. So he's got more advanced now and now does live graphic abstracts, which went out on social media. This is just gonna repeat the data I've said. Uh, so credit to Hans for working very nicely on this. He was always conscious that it was too slow, but I said, if you haven't seen the data, it's too fast. <laughs> So we put these things on social media and you know we get tens of thousands of hits on them which is fascinating they obviously do go around the world and this is a sort of uk only message really so this paper is published and at the moment um uh, clinoto have agreed to publish it basically under COVID search collaborative and they will get a list of authors which i have only finalized today and these are the authors from argentina belgium brazil canada etc down to ghana and uh, it goes on for several pages and so i'm now going to have to break it to clinoto that they're going to have to make each and every name on this as uh, a author for pubmed and um, it's interesting dealing with the journals which of them take this in their stride which of them after 45 emails gradually get what you want and which of them totally refuse and amongst the covid surge portfolio of papers um, there have been journals that have accepted the data, but ultimately, after a few weeks, have refused to accept the number of co-authors, and um, the papers have been retracted, and we've had to submit them elsewhere. And um, yeah, that's interesting. And I, I don't personally know whether this era will be the new future or whether we'll have broken this approach, and in fact, um, you know, we've broke Scopus and some of the other metrics. So the, I mentioned at the beginning, we also um, looked at international data and that's um, so the, the British data was published very quickly um, because it was a very clear message about capacity. But when we started to unpick the data we got, there were slightly more subtle and interesting uh, messages about um, the global picture. So this paper is the global wealth disparities which drive adherence to COVID safe pathways. Uh, and this is the first time this data has been seen. Um, what I was particularly interested in was high, upper middle, lower middle and low income countries. So that's the lower half of this table. And so we're able to collect data from February this year and just to see how people are able to comply with what we now know is good practice. Now good practice would be uniform pre-op testing, um, pre-op pre staff testing, um, using PPE for all procedures, and vaccinating your staff. And so what we saw is this gradient um, and uh, in terms of uh, patient testing, um, we've got the gradient from near 100% to near 50% um, smoothly from high to low income. 
for staff testing, um, we can see, uh, interestingly, only 40%, even in the high income countries, I thought staff testing was near universal, down to essentially zero for lower middle income and low income countries. And uh, the use of PPE, which is more common, but again, as this gradient of use. And now, well, I guess won't surprise you, but in some ways is shocking, um, but it's, I guess, shocking in an unsurprising way is that nobody in low income countries is being vaccinated, not even head and neck surgeons. Um, and there's this gradation of vaccination. Now, I suspect everybody on this call has been vaccinated and aren't we lucky? Um, there is uh, a message here, isn't there, about the disparity in need for vaccination, but currently the high COVID rates are in what, India and Brazil, and I suspect um, they've got some catching up to do. So this paper um, will be out soon. For those of you as part of the collaborative, you'll have had a WhatsApp message with the manuscript contained within today, and we're hoping to get that submitted by the end of the week. Um, there will be, um, from this bit of data, um, a final bit of work on international capacity, uh, which we may develop into another manuscript. I wanted to finish just by uh, talking through some of the other COVID surge outputs, which I think are quite important. So this um, was the first output, uh, bringing all the cancer data together. And when I say all the cancer data, it was the first cull from all the specialties. So we were able to look at 9,171 cancer operations internationally by before, between the 1st of, eight, 1st of March and about the middle of April, looking at the 30 day outcomes. And the focus of this paper, which was looking, um, which is published in Journal of Clinical Oncology, um, was looking at 30 day COVID rates and uh, 30 day mortality and pulmonary complications. And it was looking by um, hot and cold surgical pathways. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you, just going back a few slides, if you are able to test and you're able to provide staff testing, PPE and so forth, and put patients in areas of the hospital away from COVID patients, that's a COVID free pathway. And so in some parts of the world, that's uh, like a cancer hospital that's separate from the COVID, but in, in Britain, that means uh, silver wards or green wards, whatever they're called, or equivalent for theatres. I guess what we've all been experiencing over the last year. And, and what we found, so this was uh, last, end of last summer, um, was that we had the split between hot and cold surgical units, and we managed to basically halve the pulmonary complication rates and halve the mortality. So the mortality um, in people who got uh, in the hot surgical pathway was overall 22%. Um, oh, I've got this data wrong. Um, the mortality, sorry, was 1.7%. Um, um, and in the COVID cold surgical pathways was 0.7%. So, you know, more than half, you know, less than half rather the, the mortality and pulmonary complications, um, again, was half from 4.9% to 2.2%. So if anybody internationally needed any evidence to open a COVID-free part of the hospital or a COVID-free hospital, this was the evidence. You can reduce mortality significantly. And if you think about surgical oncology, something that reduces mortality by two or 3% is quite rare in these days. Um, so it's well worth doing. Um, the slightly earlier paper, which so this was a report on patients who had surgery whilst they had COVID. So generally these were emergency admissions and uh, patients with quite high risk overall, but also included some elective cancer operations. This is really early data. And what we found was that, you know, the operating theater was a very dangerous place to be for a patient with COVID, probably very dangerous for the staff as well. So there were uh, 1,128 patients who had COVID, who had surgery, and the mortality rate was 24%. And um, that was a really key message. And it was so key, it got published straight away in the Lancet. And that was quite early last summer. I think it was published in July. And the first of the really high impact publications. Um, and then this is COVID surge week, and I'm sure many of you will have contributed to this. So this was data from a week in October. Um, and I remember being told about this and I said, oh, by October, COVID will be over. And we, we had a significant second wave in Liverpool in October, November, very significant. 
So they collected data on 140,000 patients um, in 1,674 hospitals across 116 countries. And ultimately this was the, I guess, the money shot from this uh, paper where the question was, if you have COVID and recovering, how long should you leave it before you have elective surgery provided safe to wait? And the answer came back very clearly, you should leave it seven weeks. Because if you leave it not to two weeks, three to four weeks, five to six weeks, you have an increased risk of 30 day mortality. By the time you leave it to seven weeks or over, you return to the baseline risk, the equivalent risk of patients who've never had COVID. And so really nice bit of work and congratulations to colleagues in Birmingham for pulling this off. Uh, a paper with 140,000 patients in with essentially zero funding and an authorship in a journal like Anesthesia with 15,000 authors. Um, and, you know, this is fascinating. It's the biggest that's ever been done by a margin. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the, uh, some of the data unpacked um, by uh, elective surgical resilience and delays to surgery and uh, impact on resectability. So putting all of the papers together um, is really interesting. This slide's too small to read probably, but basically this lists the dozen or so papers so far. And I say it's been really interesting dealing with the journals. Some of the journals have got this collaborative authorship model straight away, like the Lancet. Some of them have been very receptive. So they've been able to send them data and say, look, this is what the data is going to show. This is how we're going to write the paper. Can you send this out for review? By the time we've reviewed it, the data will have changed. There'll be a new data lock and all the numbers will be different. And we'll just have to agree to resubmit it for peer review if the message has changed. But all we're going to do is, is tighten the error bars and the whiskers on the box and whisker plots. And some of the journals have been nimble and able to say, yeah, got that. Uh, I like that approach. We'll send out the data you've got for review. We'll, pr we'll publish it pre-peer review for now. And we will aim to go print with all of your thousands of authors and with whatever final data you've got. Other journals have spat it out and they said, we don't want to see that. We want to see your final paper. And we're willing to accept a finite number of authors. And, and there's been this really interesting process going on. And I think the problem is that some of the journals, some of the journal editors, when we've asked them at the beginning, are you happy, happy with a collaborative authorship model? They've said yes. They actually haven't understood the question. And so some of the greatest delays and some of our great frustrations because they've agreed to do something they didn't understand and they didn't read the email. And we've often talked to them about it on the phone just to check because in some ways for some of these outputs, we're less interested in impact factor of the journal. We just need them to, to run with the collaborative authorship model. And so, you know, whether we're actually breaking this model or whether we're making it, well, time will tell. What we have seen is um, Scopus can't deal with these metrics. So I'm corresponding author on two of these papers. I'm in the writing group on several of them and uh, none of them appear in my Scopus record. So we've broken some of the metrics that people rely on in judging academic merit. So I don't know how much that matters. Um, we will see. And there will be more papers come of this. So what's next for Head and Neck is uh, the data for all 5,500 we'll look at and we'll try and publish that. And, and then we've got the follow on data for those 5,500 at one year and two years. So we've got at least a couple more papers to come. So I promised to speak for 30 something minutes and I think I've done that. So I was going to stop screen sharing and take any questions. It's okay. just a, an incredible, such an incredible achievement by all, all your team, Prof Shaw. And, and, I, and I, I feel a bit conscious of saying your team. I feel like that diminishes the size of the, the effort. It's, it's obviously such a big collaboration. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we do have some questions come through. Um, one of the first questions I think is quite interesting, um, and it's, it's maybe not specific to the COVID surge data, but I, I thought your, your, your opinion on this question might be interesting. Any sort of uh, allowing for time constraints now, but what, what would you say is kind of 
facilitates or allows the success of col collaborative work, collaborative research projects or collaborative studies. Um, I'm very mindful of the context in which you place, you know, resistance, for example, from journals. It's yes. probably just one example of how resistance might be met for collaborative work. So I guess somebody, this person is asking kind of if you were to give like your your magic wand, if there was a magic wand for helping it, what would it be? So I think, um, so I mean, there's some fairly profound questions come out of this. Um, mm -hmm. One of which is, do we need journals? Mm. Um, do we, so do we, yeah. get, do we get peer review for whatever funding we need? Do we get peer review for the methodology and the approach to the data handling? So we get peer review essentially of the funding and the methods. And then the data just appears live with live uh, data, just as far as we've got on a website. Do we need a journal? Um, is there such a thing as final day to draw a line under it? That's it. And I mean, the public, <laughs> the medical publishing model is interesting to say the least, if you look at it. Um, so, you know, which bit of this do the journals pay for? <laughs> so, you know, people like me get paid by other people. I get paid by the NHS and the university. I spend my own time uh, or the university's time generating research grants. So CIUK or the NHR or whoever, put money into the research, somebody else pays for the research to be done. Um, and then patients, I guess, pay, they pay with their information. Yeah, it's their information on patients, isn't it? Then I spend my time writing the paper, then I send it to the journal, often paying for the journal to review it. Yeah, yeah. And then the journal send it out to reviewers who they don't pay to review it. And then they sell the journal to us. Yeah. And, you know, if we had uh, the International Journal of Collaborative Surgical Research or the International Journal of the ENT Research that was a collaborative thing, you know, we wouldn't need any money. We just need a software platform. You know, nobody actually reads bits of paper anymore, do they? I mean, I'm just curious whether the authorship model will, will hold up. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated because in my specialty, if you take our, our little journals like Genoto and B. Joms, um, they're interesting because they're different. So our, our specialty own our journal and gets thousands, tens of thousands of income from it every year, yeah. whereas your specialty doesn't own Clinoto, so they don't get the income. Mm. And it's fascinating. You should, you know, should potentially, I don't know, form your own journal that you do own to at least the specialty could own it. So the, your, your, your narrow question, which was what makes collaboratives work? So um, obviously public, publishing the data is okay, but only just. So I think the key things are um, the, the question has got to get people, right? So um, the question last March was really key. I think everybody was hungry for some answers. So that tapped into a real thing. Um, the second thing, I guess, it's got to be polit pitched politically at the right level. So um, if we can get a universal approval from all the recognisable bodies, that would help. So if ENT UK and your, mm. your trainee group and this and that and the other and international bodies all get behind it and say, yeah, do this, that helps. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but it helps. And I think the collaborative authorship model, like for people on this call, they'll have quite a few papers. I've got a few papers. So does having another paper in B. Joms or Clinoto make much difference to my CV? It probably doesn't, does it? it it's just one more paper. But um, looking at the people out there contributing data to COVID surge, uh, if they're in Ethiopia or they're in Peru or somewhere else, they really, really care about that paper. Yeah. And to be part of a bigger thing and to be published. What they don't wanna hear is, oh, Richard balls it up with a journal and then the journal editors rolled, uh, unable to roll them over, unable to get the model. So we've just gone with 15 co-authors and everybody else is covered in COVID surge. Is that all right? For them, that's not all right. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll walk, they, you know, they'll mentally walk out the door and not contribute further. As in, if they have faith that come what may, we will get their name on the paper, even if we have to retract papers and submit them to worse journals. Yeah. or some other form of publishing with a name on it. I think that's the way you get buy-in. So I think that genuine collaborative approach, ultimately somebody has to make decisions, somebody has to write the paper, but it is dependent on that wide contribution of data. Um, and I think that's really important. 
That's really beautifully phrased and, and, and very eye-opening for those of us who perhaps haven't engaged with this. I, I know that, um, I mean, you, you've mentioned social media a few times. There's been quite a lively debate about the publishing, published, perish, uh, you know, adage and, and, and the idea of how publishing models work um, amongst MedEd Twitter. So, um, yeah, interesting. And, and a lot of points that you've raised have come up in that. So I'm really glad to hear you sort of engage with that thinking as well. Um, we've got a, a more clinical type question really here. Um, somebody's written here about the, the COVID, COVID track um, publications seem to suggest that rates of surgical infection were, were quite, quite low. Now, I, they, I think they've asked here, essentially, do you, do you, what do you think was the difference? Have anything else to add as to what, what might contribute? Maybe our, we were so stringent with our PPE and the panic about tracheostomies. Perhaps, perhaps that's the reason I, 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 I was welcoming your thoughts on that. Rajuti, you went a bit quiet in the middle, but I think you're asking about, were you talking about COVID infection rates? Yes, yeah, so the COVID infection rates amongst um, the Health surgeons workers. Workers, in yeah. COVID track wasn't very high, as yeah. opposed to you know slightly more alarming numbers in COVID surge. Yeah, I suppose I don't know the answer to that. Um, and of course, there's nothing that proves the data I've shown you that the healthcare workers got COVID from the patients. You know, they could have got yeah. it from, or, or you know, they might have got it from being redeployed to another part of the hospital and got COVID, and they were operating on another day. And there were a lot of things happening at once, if you remember. I mean, I, you know, we were asked in Liverpool to do COVID tracheostomies on a Monday and a Tuesday and then go and do our elective cancer activity on a Thursday. And at a certain point, I said, Look, I just don't think this is a good idea for the patient. Mm. I think that we should do a couple of weeks of COVID, week off, and then go back to our elective activity for three weeks and have a little rotor like that. It doesn't make sense to be mixing and matching activity because most of us are relatively young and fit. We get COVID, we might not even notice, but we might kill our patients. And I, I have noticed as well, I think the data in intensive care and amongst the anaesthetic community is that their practice was pretty safe. And you know how many uh, intensive care consultants have died of COVID in the last year? It's very few, isn't it? I, I don't know whether, did I hear yeah. it's none? But I mean, it's very, very few. I think I heard that, yeah. Is it none? I think that they their PPE was tight. It's also interesting, you know, by the time people reach intensive care, whether they are as infectious, or whether they're actually burnt out infections, I don't know. Um, and I, I suppose I don't know the answer to that totally. What what we have seen, and we've got it in this um, this latest paper we've, we've sent around today, is that head and neck surgeons are using less and less PPE at the moment. And that comes down to what your motivation for using PPE is. Mm. So I think a year ago, if we're honest, most of it was protect ourselves, right? And now we've been vaccinated. I mean, most of us have had COVID and been vaccinated, right? So we, or, or, you know, we, we've become somewhat complacent about our own personal risk. I think that's a fact, right? Mm. And the reason you'd be wearing it now is for your patient's benefit. And so a year ago, we didn't have to worry about whether it's for our benefit or patient's benefit, we just wore it. And, and I don't know why you'd be wear, wearing less PPE now than at other time points. And I, I am concerned that what we'll see is an increased community rate of COVID through the summer, but without necessarily seeing hospitals affected so badly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we need to be cautious before throwing the PPE out. And I think we're all doing it. But if you think about it carefully, the vulnerable person in the operating theatre is not us, it's the patient. Yeah. Yeah. So I, really I, don't, I, I think ITU were really tight on PPE and doing COVID tracheostomies. I remember doing them. Um, and I think the, uh, the arrangements in early days and more recently in cancer surgery were looser arrangements. I think that's probably true to say. I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I remember an anecdote of one of my anaesthetic colleagues who's also an intensivist who I haven't seen for a year hardly because she's been drawn into intensive care. But she said she went to do a patient retrieval early doors and they were dressed up you know, in their hazmat suits with their full PPE to one of the respiratory wards in the hospital to pick up a patient who deteriorated and needed to be ventilated and what have you. So they went to this ward all dressed up to the nines as you would and, and the nurses are sat at the nursing station having a takeaway. You know, so, so the level of um, yeah. COVID awareness and PPE for the same patient in different parts of the hospital was radically different. 
And I'm that's sure that was common throughout the NHS. Yeah, and, and probably internationally. That's a really interesting anecdote. Um, we've got a really nice question, actually, that fits in nicely after that conversation um, about the data that has been collected in COVID surge. Um, and there are some specifically for head and neck, but I suppose you may have it for other non-head and neck surgery. Was the type of PPE worn recorded, including fit testing outcomes of staff? And um, anything that you can rec you identified in your data about differences or similarities of the standard between countries? No, and I think you know if you were doing a um, an interventional trial, you would nail this stuff down very easily, and you collect mm -hmm. a very small number of patients, uh, small number of samples, you know, patients or whatever it is. So, so you would you would ask a totally different question if you wanted to tighten up on those sorts of questions. So you you would. You do the same as well if you wanted to diagnose COVID. You have a very strict diagnostic criteria. So in this sort of study, um, because of the language barrier and because of uh, different standards in different countries, you have to accept a slightly rougher question and slightly rougher answers. Okay. And, and so that that comes in. It's a fair criticism of all this data. It is that one person's PPE may not be another person's. And the idea of then having a subsidiary um, page of the CRF on REDCap just to ask about the PPE at each level would mean that less and less people would enter the data because they become exhausted entering the data. So the selling point was you could do an operation and you could put the data down in two minutes and come back in 30 days and you could get the follow-up data in another 30 seconds. And the more, so we were given 10 data fields by COVID surge to add for the head and neck. And of course, we, we, we were given 10 and, and we put a few more on, of course we did. But yeah, they wanted to constrain the number of questions. Super, thank you for that. Um, my, my final question is going to be tiered with three, three linked questions that people have come through. But my penultimate question, yes. um, is there any evidence coming out either from COVID surge um, or, or otherwise about non-cancer treatments and sort of timescale for getting to surgery for those? Um, and also, uh, is there anything in either the head and neck data or, or COVID surge data generally about, um, I guess, asymptomatic carriers of COVID? Was there anything from that about their impact on, of, of being an asymptomatic um, COVID carrier? Is there any impact on surgery outcomes for that? So, um, so there was modelling done. And I'm trying to remember whether that modelling has been updated in a recent publication. But the data on non-cancer, non-urgent surgery is horrible, isn't it? The, the, we're back to we're back to the worst era of the NHS before you mm -hmm. lot were mm -hmm. even medical students that I can remember, where people went onto waiting lists and just never came off them, yeah. and um, people waited in corridors and A and E for forty hours at a time. You you don't remember that? I do. I was doing my house jobs, and it was just accepted. And it's amazing how far the NHS has come. Yeah. People like to do the NHS down, but up until March last year, um, you know, we still had uh, some fragilities, but we weren't making people wait like we're going to have to wait now. So mm -hmm. I, I, I've only seen the modelling in the first paper that was went big was a uh, British Journal of Surgery paper that the Birmingham group did. And essentially it was on predictive modeling. And, and I think, unfortunately, like many things last March, of all the different models of what might happen, that's the worst one that happened. Mm. And I have um, only kind of negative feelings about how long this is going to take to resolve. I think it's going to take years to resolve. And your question about asymptomatic carriage, I haven't seen that data. I mean, there are some, there are quite nice studies going on where we're testing with very sensitive tests of NHS staff. Um, and I, I haven't seen that data translate into um, cross-infection data. Fine. Well, thank you very much for that, because that, that at least signposts our, um, our attendees to looking out for the stuff and looking out for the data that's coming through. So this, this last sort of nebulous question, we had three different questions, which I thought can kind of link. Um, the first question was to you about how, how is your practice or how is Liverpool managing to increase capacity, if at all? Second question is about how is this, how can the COVID surge data or the information we're getting from it be translated to kind of... Um, almost regional or national kind of management decision making. And then the third question we had was, do you think the stuff that's being generated out of COVID surge, whether it's the head and neck specific or um, the, the wider project, do you think it has a role for actual better modeling and better decision making for the next 
big health hit you know I don't want to wish us another pandemic but you know what I mean like for future future events that might need similar things because one of your points in the very early slides is about how we kind of missed the boat a little bit we had a bit of warning and we didn't make use of that lag time between being hit badly in England and and, and Wales and, and actually acting on that so just sort of three layers of, of sorry it's quite a long question but just three so, layers there so I think in, in the broad I think this approach could be used to answer other questions that need to be answered on this broad basis. And of course, that's how it started. If you look at the, res the research the Global Surgery Unit were doing for Birmingham, they were about things like wound infection and so forth. They weren't, you know, they, they repurposed totally towards this, misusing their NHR program grant. Uh, and, um, you know, it's been hugely impactful, far more impactful probably than their original research, but they're going back to normal now. I mean, yeah, I guess people are predicting there will be other global pandemics and I'm sure we would be better prepared in all senses. You'd kind of hope that you wouldn't need this kind of guerrilla warfare to research to answer the questions. We'd be better organised, wouldn't you? You'd kind of hope that. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the response um, within the UK, you know, particularly, I suppose, the quite political message from February this year, um, it was fascinating that... Um, so what happened was quite interesting. A lot of the surgical associations went big when they cancelled our second dose of vaccine, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. In December or January, Chris Whitty said, uh-oh, we're in this race of vaccine versus cases. We're going to stop healthcare workers having the second dose because it's going to make a big impact on getting the over 80s vaccinated. And all of our surgical associations went ballistic. And as it turns out, they were wrong. And they got the fingers burnt. They got told off. And um, they were very reluctant to say anything about the organisation of cancer services. And... Um, I think it's true to say that the special associations were very reluctant to follow up on the data that that paper produced. Mm. From our point of view, um, we've been having phone calls from Birmingham. We, we agreed to take cases from Birmingham. Our surgical capacity in Liverpool was quite badly hit. What we did was one thing that kept us going, apart from um, fighting on many levels within a group of, you know, 30 odd surgeons. Um, what we did is that we recovered our major head and neck cases on the general ward and didn't use ITU for a year. So we probably went backwards to using more tracheostomies and sent our patients back to the ward and avoided using ITU and that kept us going. And uh, other places said, no, 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 you need ITU, we can't have ITU so we can't do the cases. And um, there were very few cases where there were medical issues that cropped up um, with our patients on the ward that we couldn't handle. And in fact, IT were very understanding about it. So that's one thing we did. And in terms of, you know, we've got a big elective workload as well, and that has suffered hugely and continues to do so. And I'm sure it's the same for all your colleagues everywhere, is that currently, you know, the genuinely elective stuff, stuff that can go on waiting lists and wait for six months. So there's a lot of that in ENT, there's some of that in maxillofacial, and it's, it's particularly severely affected, isn't it? And, and, I, and I don't know when that'll catch back up. And I, I wonder whether some of the indications for surgery will permanently shift, actually. Yeah, that's a really good observation. Very interesting. Right, we are 21.01, so we're pretty much bang on time. So that's amazing. Thank you so much, Prof. Shaw. Um, I feel very lucky. I feel like I've had the opportunity to have a, a personal one-to-one -one conversation with you and learn lots. And um, I hope the rest of the attendees have really enjoyed it as well. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, there is a link in the chat, please, if you could provide some feedback, it helps us to know what to alter, what to target, what to change, what to continue with in our in our programme. So please do put your feedback through. Um, and we have our next meeting in May. It's going to be on problematic parotid by um, Mr. Francis Baz. So we'll send the details out for that again. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank Prof Shaw. Just a phenomenal presentation. And I want to actually thank the all the people that col collaborated with you and contributed to this. I mean, you know, our, our thanks probably means very little, but I think it's important that we do say that we do appreciate how much work all the people who worked with you and for you have done towards this. Um, and thank you so much to yourselves and, and your co-authors for, for getting this information out there to us all. Um, so thank you again, Prof. Shaw. It's been, a, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions. And the way to thank me is to uh, enter the follow-up data for those of you, and then many of you will be involved entered patients march last year you know go the extra mile and get the follow-up data and we can we can continue to publish